All right. So, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Andrew Gustafson, uh, and I'm from Turnstile Tours or Turnstile Online. This is our first uh, and what will be a daily series of programs that we're going to do every day at 11 o'clock. Um, you know, with everything that's happening in the world and here in New York City, we're haven't been able to give tours now for about a week, and we don't know how long that's going to continue. So we really want to um, stay engaged uh, with our wonderful community of not only our tour participants, our visitors, our loyal customers, um, but also this great network of partners that we have. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Turnstile Tours um, before we uh, dive into today's topic, which is inventions of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, that I'm not the only one from Turnstile Tours that's online today. So uh, we also have um, our president and my wife, Cindy, uh, who's handling all of the technical details to make this happen this morning. Uh, and then we also have uh, Stefan uh, Dreisbach Williams, who is going to be doing the closed captioning. So if you want to watch this video uh, without sound, um, or if uh, you have a hearing impairment or are deaf, um, you can turn on closed captioning. Um, so, so turn on the closed captioning um, if you'd like to, to have that. Um, so like I said, this is our first in a series we're gonna be doing every day uh, at 11 o'clock and we're gonna be highlighting different partners, different sites, um, different stories. Um, some are things that are taken from our tours, um, and some of them are things that um, we've never had the opportunity to fit into a tour. Um, so we're really excited to, to be able to do this. So every day it's going to run about 30 to 45 minutes. It'll depend on the topic and also depend on how many questions that uh, you have. Um, so feel free to drop your questions uh, into the chat here and Cindy will feed them to me and, and we'll try and get to uh, as many of them uh, as we can. I just want to acknowledge the fact that this is an experiment. Um, we're trying this out, um, see how it goes. So please also uh, give us your feedback um, because we would love to hear how we can improve, how we can make this more engaging. Um, and also tell us things that you want to hear from us about, what you want to learn about. Um, just um, another one last little piece of, of housekeeping I just want to mention, um, how you can sign up for more of these. Um, so like I said, we're doing these every day. Um, this is our first one, so we're doing it for free. Um, but most of them uh, will be, uh, it's just $5 a session. Uh, and you can sign up for those right on our website at turnstiletours.com. Um, We'll be doing a free one uh, every week. Um, so our next free one is gonna be next Wednesday. Uh, and that's gonna be about the history of New York City public markets. Um, but tomorrow we have um, a session that's gonna be taking in someone from outside Turnstile Tours. We're gonna be working um, with Saad Borkati, who's the owner of Essex Olive and Spice, uh, which is in the Essex market. And he's gonna do a virtual olive oil tasting. So, uh, if you have a bottle of olive oil in your house, you can take part. Even if you don't, you can learn uh, what to look for um, next time you buy olive oil. Um, and then on Saturday, we're going to do a, a, a special session um, all about the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Um, and then on Sunday, we'll, we're going to do one about Prospect Park with myself um, and our colleague um, and tour guide, Doug Chapman. Um, so those are some of the things uh, that are coming up here. So. Uh, diving right into today's topic. So we're going to be talking about the inventions of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, you know, I want to give people a little bit of background. I know many of you have probably been to the Navy Yard before, maybe you've even been on our tours before, but some of you, this might be um, completely new territory. So I'll give you a little bit of background um, about the Navy Yard and, and the work that we do there. Um, so we at Turnstile Tours, all the tours we do are in partnership with nonprofit and community organizations. Um, and so our largest program that we offer is at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We've been working there now for 12 years um, in partnership with the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. And so the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation uh, is the nonprofit that runs the site on behalf of the city. And so today it's home, uh, it's an industrial park. Uh, it's no longer operated by the U.S. Navy. We don't build ships there anymore, though we do repair ships. 
Uh, and it's home to about 500 companies and about 12,000 jobs, most of them in industry, manufacturing, uh, and design. Uh, so historically, it's always been a center of innovation, and it's still a center of, of innovation uh, today. So I'm going to pull up a picture here. So um, again, if folks aren't familiar with it, you can uh, see what it looks like. Um, just bear with me for one second. Okay, so here's the beautiful uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so the property uh, or the, the yard itself was founded in 1801 um, as a federal shipbuilding and ship repair facility. And so it operated as such from 1801 all the way up until 1966. And it was really one of the premier shipyards of the U.S. Navy. Now, in those 165 years, um, the Navy Yard only built about 130 ships for the U.S. Navy. So uh, we don't say we built the U.S. Navy here. We say this is where we kept it afloat. Um, so repair, modernization, and outfitting were really the primary uses of the Brooklyn Navy Yard over the course of its history. Um, and so in, uh, you know, when we're talking about um, what the work was that was done at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, we weren't only repairing ships and building some ships. This was also really a center of innovation and design. Um, this is where they often piloted new ship designs. Um, so innovation is really baked into the history um, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, from the very beginning. And there's some innovations we're not going to talk about in depth today, but I'll just mention, you know, for example, in 1837, we built the first steam-powered warship of the U.S. Navy called, called the USS Fulton. Um, we uh, built some of the first iron clad ships during the Civil War, some of the first steel-hulled ships. Um, we did a lot of experimentation um, and new development. Uh, in propulsion as well over the course of its history. So it's really always been a center of innovation and today it still is. So um, I'm going to switch back here because I want to show you uh, a product, um, an invention here at the yard. Um, so this is something called Ice Stone. Uh, so this is a product um, that's used for countertops. So this is actually made out of recycled glass. Um, so it's three components, it's recycled glass, um, cement and, and pigment um, to create this really beautiful product that comes in a couple dozen different colors. This is the color uh, Gotham Gray. So this is one of the little samples um, that, that we use on our tour. So um, this is actually a technology that was pioneered at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and today they continue to do their um, uh, they're continuing to do uh, continuing to um, do all of their manufacturing and distribution from their facility um, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so we had a question from one of our attendees, which is what is happening with the yard um, as a result of um, this terrible situation uh, with uh, coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, so, you know, I'll direct you to the official line of the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. So you can go to their website at brooklynnavyyard.org. You can follow them um, on social media, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and they've been um, updating continuously. Um, you know, what I can say is that, you know, they've limited um, areas of public gathering. So for example, um, the museum, uh, Building 92, um, is currently closed. Uh, they've also removed the seating from Building 77, the food manufacturing hub. Um, so they've tried to limit the areas where, where people can gather. Where we go from here, you know, we, we, we can't say, we're not going to speculate, um, but you can stay tuned to what's happening um, over at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, you know, as a city owned property, you know, they take directives from the city and, and so we'll see what happens. Obviously, you know, it's going to be very disruptive um, to everybody's lives, um, but you know, it's especially uh, hard at the Brooklyn Navy Yard because again, it's, it's a place where about 12,000 people uh, work every day. So a lot of people's livelihoods are being affected um, by, this, by this whole situation. Um, so that's a little bit of an introduction um, to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. If you have any sort of general questions um, about the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, I had another question here, which is about uh, the t-shirt that I'm wearing. So 
You can see it says Brooklyn Navy Yard on it. Um, you can get these when they're back up and running um, at the Building 92 gift shop. Um, the hat I'm wearing right here, this is not from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. This is not a ship that was built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, but it's the reference to a ship we're gonna talk about a little bit later on. So this is the USS Constellation, which is a historic ship um, in Baltimore. Um, sadly, like so many historic sites and museums, they've also had to shut down as a result um, of the COVID-19 um, situation. So we're sending our love and support um, to those folks down there who do such a great job with um, all those his historic ships um, in Inner Harbor um, in, in Baltimore. Okay, so today we're going to talk about three inventions um, that really tell kind of three different stories. Um, so we're going to talk about the first invention we're going to talk about um, from the 19th century really had a huge impact, um, not just at the Navy Yard, not just in the Navy, um, but really across the globe. It was a, a major, major um, innovation. Um, the second one we were going to we're going to talk about um, really highlights the ingenuity of the Brooklyn Navy Yard and its workers to solve problems. Um, shipbuilding by its nature is really an innovative exercise um, because you know when you're building a ship, uh, especially if you're a Navy shipbuilder, you're building a very very complex machine, and you really don't have step-by-step -step instructions for how to build it. It's not like building this Ikea bookcase here. Uh, the shipbuilder and the workers who are actually in the yard have to figure out how to put those pieces together. And if it's a brand new ship with uh, a brand new design, which is often happening at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, you know, you have to work on the fly and, and figure those things out. So we're going to talk about that process. And then the third one we're going to talk about um, is kind of a, a fun, an interesting artifact that we happen to have in our collection um, that was uh, created at one of the centers of innovation at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is a place called the Material Science Laboratory, um, later known as the uh, Navy Applied Science Laboratory. Um, and so we'll not only get to talk about it and see pictures of it, we'll actually get to see it in the flesh and we're going to do a little demonstration uh, and use it. Um, so I'm going to switch back to uh, sharing a screen so I can show you some pictures here. Um, so there's the Navy Yard again. Um, So there's Cindy leading a tour. We wish we could be doing this, uh, you know, from the dry dock or from a, a spot in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but instead you get to see uh, our apartment here. Um, so there's Cindy at, at dry dock number one, uh, which again, we're gonna be talking about a week from today. Uh, that'll be another uh, session we're gonna be doing next Thursday, all about uh, dry dock number one. Okay, so um, today is actually a, a pretty important anniversary. Um, 75 years ago was the uh, attack on a ship called the USS Franklin. Um, in, uh, on March 19th, 1945, this ship was operating um, about 60 miles off the coast of Japan, um, launching bombing raids against the Japanese home islands. Um, Early in the morning, uh, the ship was hit by a, a single bomb. A Japanese bomber managed to penetrate the air defenses of the Franklin, um, and that bomb fell in the rear of the flight deck and actually penetrated the flight deck and exploded in the hangar deck, uh, which is where all of those fully fueled and armed aircraft uh, were waiting um, for the day's missions. Um, so that set off this chain reaction in the ship, and um, it was absolutely devastating. Um, you might guess that the Franklin sank from the condition that it looks like in, in this photograph, which was taken um, shortly after the attack began. Um, but the Franklin um, actually managed to survive, although at a terrible, terrible cost. Um, so more than 800 sailors were killed. Um, and the USS Franklin in its short service life in World War II actually lost more uh, personnel than any other ship in the US Navy, with the exception of the USS Arizona, which was also built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and so I mention this um, because in the uh, aftermath um, of all of this, um, Vice Admiral Ross McIntyre uh, wrote a letter um, thanking a particular Brooklyn company um, for the high quality medical supplies that they um, supplied to the, uh, the crew of the Franklin, um, which he said saved countless lives um, in this attack. Um, and that letter, uh, he wrote to a company um, called ER Squibb and Sons. Um, so this is one of the um, 
maybe best known companies to come out of Brooklyn. Today, it's now known as uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, but this is a company that actually got its start uh, really in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the founder. Um, just uh, by way of attribution, I wanna say that a lot of this um, great information comes to us from an article written by uh, James M. Schmidt um, in Navy Medicine Magazine back in 2005. Um, and so, uh, E.R. Squibb um, was born in Delaware in 1819, um, and as a young man, he joined the U.S. Navy um, as a surgeon. Uh, and so he joined in 1847, um, and this was during the Mexican War. Um, so he served on ships overseas um, for a number of years, not just during the Mexican War. Um, and one of the things that he noticed was the real really low quality of the medicines that was being supplied to the U.S. Navy. Um, the Navy was buying things from the lowest bidder, um, and often those bidders were producing subpar, um, uh, subpar equipment and supplies. And so he really set out to elevate the quality um, of those supplies that were being supplied to the, the, um, the medical corps um, of the U.S. Navy. And so he did a lot of that work from a laboratory that he helped set up at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, specifically at the Brooklyn Naval Hospital, um, which you can see here. So the hospital building in the background was built in uh, 1838. Um, and then, again, a couple of years later, uh, a laboratory building um, was built, which is where Squibb uh, did his work. Um, so he was testing the quality of supplies. Um, but another thing that he was working on was developing stable, reliable anesthetics. Um, anesthetics had been around for a while, um, including um, ether. The problem was, again, it was an issue of quality control. The, the quality was really uneven. Um, and, you know, if you give someone... Uh, ether of the wrong dosage, you can very easily kill them. So even though the product was available, many doctors chose not to use it because it was more of a risk um, than the rewards you got in, in pain management from that. Um, so he actually developed a method at the Brooklyn Navy Yard for uh, distilling this ether using, um, using steam. So sort of using indirect heat, which allowed him to much, much better control um, the quality of what was, was coming out of it. Um, so he continued to work there up until um, 1857. Uh, he actually approached the Navy and said that he wanted to set up a much, much larger scale operation for producing this. And the Navy said, no thanks. Uh, so he actually resigned his commission and, and went into private industry. So um, in 1858, he set up his uh, first factory, uh, which is in Brooklyn Heights. Um, you're dealing with a very volatile compound in ether. So shortly after he set it up, the factory actually burned down. Um, but shortly after that, he was able to rebuild it. And eventually it grew into a huge complex um, that uh, was really a, a beacon of, um, of Brooklyn Heights. Everybody recognizes this building, you may not know it or remember it as the Squid Building because this building then became um, known as the Watchtower Building. So that's the building that used to have the big Watchtower sign on it. Um, now I think it says welcome on it. Um, but anyway, so th this was the, uh, this is where he, he set up shop um, and they continued to operate there for over a hundred years. That building was there until 19, uh, or excuse me, Squid was in that building um, up until uh, 1968 when uh, shortly thereafter, it was sold to the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, who had that as their um, as their world headquarters um, for for a long time. Um, so I'm going to come out because I want to show you another our, our second artifact um, that we have here, um, and uh, this is actually um, a bottle. And so I'm going to hold this up if you can read it. There, you can see it says on the bottle, um, "Squib." This actually probably dates to the 1950s, and this did not have ether or chloroform or anything in it. Um, this actually uh, was a bottle that held um, milk of magnesia. Um, so they not only made supplies for, um, you know, prescription medicines and, and supplies for the military, they also made kind of general purpose medicines um, as well for c consumer products. Um, and so this is actually a bottle um, that we got on one of our many visits to a special place in Brooklyn, which is uh, Dead Horse Bay. If you've ever been there, you know that it's sort of at the mouth of a breached landfill. Um, 
because of the age of that landfill, um, well, today most of our landfills are filled with plastics. Um, this is before the advent of plastics. So a lot of what's in there um, and a lot of what's survived in that landfill is, is glass. Uh, so if you go down to that beach, it's absolutely covered from end to end in, in glass um, and other products that are spilling out, um, unfortunately, out of, that, out of that landfill all the time. Um, so we kept this because of its cool connection um, to, to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Okay, so as I said, this was, a, this was an invention, an important innovation that really had an impact um, really across the globe with developing, um, you know, developing uh, anesthetics. And there's lots of other medical innovations um, we can talk about uh, that were connected to Squib. So for example, another thing that he invented was um, something called the uh, Squib Pannier, uh, which is essentially a large medicine chest that he devised uh, during the Civil War as a way um, to, again, have high quality um, medicines and have everything that a surgeon might need um, in the field. Um, because what they were finding is a lot of medical supplies, they were buying them in bulk, um, and they were getting caught at the back of these long supply trains. Um, and so they weren't actually able to get the supplies into the field. So he developed um, a semi-portable, smaller uh, chest of supplies. So that's called the squid pannier. Um, but we're going to move on to um, our next invention, um, which relates to something I, I talked about before, which was um, really inventing on the fly, getting problems and figuring out um, what is, how you can solve these uh, engineering quandaries that the designers present to, for the builders to actually solve. Um, and so I'm going to talk about one of the big challenges that the Navy Yard has, has always had, um, which has to do with uh, one of its neighbors. Um, so I'm going to show you this picture right here. The Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, so if you know a little bit of your Brooklyn geography, um, you know, if uh, you go to the right of this photograph in the direction that that um, little boat is headed, um, that's actually one of the boats of the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that helps keep the harbor free of debris. Um, if you keep going right, you go under the Brooklyn Bridge, under the Manhattan Bridge, and then um, to your right will be Wallabout Bay, uh, which is where the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, is located. So when the Navy Yard opened in 1801, um, there were no bridges. It had an open path uh, straight out to the Atlantic Ocean. But the first bridge to be built on the East River was, of course, um, the Brooklyn Bridge right here. So the Brooklyn Bridge, um, they started construction in 1869, um, and there was actually a lot of opposition um, to the construction of the bridge. Um, part of it came from Brooklynites uh, who rightly feared um, that uh, connecting to Manhattan would eventually lead to the independent city of Brooklyn being some subsumed into the city of New York, which happened in 1898. Um, but also, um, people felt that it would threaten commerce uh, on the East River. Um, so actually, in 1876, a group of shippers um, actually sued the company that was building the Brooklyn Navy Yard to try and block it. Um, that, was, uh, that lawsuit was eventually thrown out of court. Um, but the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, you know, they had a big problem with it. Um, and actually, you know, the, the Brooklyn Bridge isn't completed until 1883, but the first ship to actually hit the Brooklyn Bridge happened in 1878. Um, and it was actually a ship um, coming into the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and this was before this roadway um, was in place. What was in place was the cables that you can see stretched across. So they were spinning the cables across um, uh, the river um, and during that time is when actually the, the top mast of a ship called the USS Minnesota hit it. And there were a couple other incidences too during construction um, where tall sailing ships actually uh, hit the Brooklyn Bridge. So it was, uh, it was a challenge and the Navy wasn't entirely happy about it. Um, as we get into the 20th century, this is a photo from 1916 showing the USS Arizona um, after having just passed under the the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and you can see in this photo, um, there are these two um, tall structures sticking up uh, from, the, uh, from the USS Arizona. Um, these are what are called cage masts, um, or they're artillery spotting masts. Um, as 
the firepower of these ships was, was growing incredibly. All of a sudden, we were creating artillery that could fire um, rounds much, much further can anyone could, than anyone could see. Um, and so what we needed was to be able to get a higher and higher view um, so that you could spot, uh, you could spot um, where you were firing at. Um, so even though sailing ships and their tall masts are, are disappearing, uh, we're building these modern battleships um, that have these big cage masts on them. So these could barely, barely fit uh, under the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, during World War II, this became a problem as ships were getting bigger and bigger again, um, and we have more and more traffic coming in and out of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And so to deal with this, um, the Navy actually um, built an annex uh, to the Brooklyn Navy Yard in Bayonne, New Jersey. So you can see that on this map. So the Brooklyn Navy Yard is up in the top right corner. Um, you can see that blue area and you can see it's obstructed from access to the upper New York Bay and the Atlantic Ocean um, by these two bridges, the Manhattan Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge. So what they did was they built an annex. They built another dry dock, another whole shipyard out in Bayonne, south of all those bridges. So what ships would do is they would come up uh, if they were too large to fit under the bridge, they would come up, go to Bayonne, have large sections of their mass communications equipment um, taken off so they could fit under the Brooklyn Bridge, and then they would go back to Bayonne. After the primary work was done in Brooklyn, they'd go back to Bayonne, have those pieces put back on, and then they'd go back to sea. Um, so it was a pretty tight squeeze. So I'm going to show you a picture of what this looked like. Um, so this right here, this picture was actually taken uh, in uh, 1961. Uh, this is a World War II era aircraft carrier, um, the USS Essex passing underneath the uh, underneath the Brooklyn, uh, excuse me, passing underneath the Manhattan Bridge. Um, so this is after it's had all of its mass and everything taken off. Um, so this was a common sight going up and down the East River. These ships barely getting under dead center of the bridge at the very lowest possible tide. So they could just, just squeeze, uh, just squeeze um, through there. Um, so this ship um, isn't that big, actually, compared to modern aircraft carriers. It's about a third of the size. Um, so ships were getting bigger and bigger in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and so what they did um, was they needed to develop um, a system so they didn't have to remove all this more and more sophisticated equipment. Uh, radio masts, but also radar masts that were getting bigger and bigger. Um, they didn't want to have to take all of that off every single time a, a ship needed to be serviced at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and so this is what they came up with. Um, so this shows the folding communication mast that was developed at the Brooklyn Navy Yard starting in 1954. Um, and this uh, shows um, uh, the USS uh, Saratoga um, with this system uh, installed. Uh, and so this would be installed on, on ships across the fleet, not just ones that were built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, because again, this was one of the most important shipyards. You needed the other ships to be able to get in there and out of there if they needed service work done on them. Um, and so really dramatic picture. This is the USS Constellation. Um, so this is 1962. Passing under the Brooklyn Bridge, you can see that mast fully folded down there. Um, and so we've actually had the opportunity to meet a number of uh, crew members and workers who actually worked on the construction of this ship. Um, and one of them was actually on the ship, uh, in the deck, uh, on the deck. So you can see, um, if you look um, sort of at the, at the bow of the ship on the left and right side um, of the um, of the flight deck, you can see large numbers of sailors gathered up there. Uh, we actually met uh, a sailor who was on that deck in this picture, and he said um, that if you stood at the very top of the ship, on the left-hand side, that's called the island of the ship, um, of the aircraft carrier. If you stood up there, um, you could reach up and touch the bottom of the Brooklyn Bridge. So there's only about six feet of clearance. In addition, I said you're moving these ships at low tide. There's only about six feet of clearance between the keel of the ship and the bed of the East River. So it was a very, very, very tight squeeze. Um, and so this is actually one of the major contributing factors for the decision to close the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, it eventually closed in 1966. But the Navy didn't want to deal with this, especially as ships are getting 
bigger and bigger. We have some of the biggest dry docks in the country. Uh, we could fit a nuclear powered aircraft carrier in our dry docks in the Navy Yard. We just can't fit a ship like that underneath the Brooklyn Bridge anymore. Um, so this was a, you know, a, a major, major a limiting factor to the size of ships we can bring in and out of the Navy Yard. But you know, they worked with what they had. Uh, and so this was something, this was a design feature that was, that was created, you know, not just by the Navy brass, not just by Naval architects, but, but actually by the, uh, the workmen and the engineers um, actually on site at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Okay, so uh, I know we have a couple questions here. Um, so, so we have a question here that I heard some ships barely pass under uh, the Verrazano Bridge. Um, does that pose a similar challenge? Um, not really, actually. The, the clearance of the Verrazano Bridge is almost double um, what it is of the Brooklyn Bridge. So it's, it's much, much taller. Some of the really big ships, um, like the, the Queen Mary, for example, you know, it's, it's pretty close, but it's, it's actually probably higher than you think. Um, the, another question we had is, um, do any other shipbuilding facilities uh, have a similar challenge? Um, not really. Actually, if you look at all of the naval shipyards today, um, but also look at the major private shipbuilders that are, that are doing shipbuilding for the U.S. Navy, none of them have an obstacle um, that's anywhere close to as low as the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty unique challenge um, uh, that we have. At the, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and the other question we had is, could they have built the Brooklyn Bridge with higher clearance like the Verrazano's? With the technology that they had at the time, this was the longest suspension bridge in the world. Um, so they were really pushing the envelope for how large and how tall uh, it could be because you're limited you know, by the size of the towers you can build, um, but also the length of the, um, of, of the um, the, the ramps that lead up to that roadway uh, as well. Um, so as ships, uh, as um, suspension bridges get taller and taller, they have to get wider and, and longer uh, as well. And so that means they take up more land um, on, on either side uh, where the anchorage is uh, of those bridges as well. So they, they tried to build it as large as they possibly could, but that's what you know, uh, the engineering of the 1860s allowed them to build uh, at the time. Um, okay, so this is, uh, I'm going to get to our, our last thing. Um, before I dive into that, because as you'll see in a second, it's going to be a little bit harder for me to talk for this next part. Um, but the question was, um, how can you see more virtual tours um, and how can you continue to support us at Turnstile Tours? I just want to say thank you. This has been incredible, um, the outpouring of support that we've gotten from everybody. So I just want to say Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody. Um, so there's a couple of ways um, that you can support us. Uh, one is if you wanna to go to our website, you can purchase a gift certificate. Uh, we really appreciate that. And that's also something you can do for lots of small businesses, especially people working in tourism and hospitality. If there's a restaurant you love, if there's another tour company you love, um, if there's a museum that you love, buy a gift certificate, buy a membership. Um, you're gonna get that value back in the future, I promise, um, but it really helps people get through these hard times when, when cash flow is just a really big issue because like us, so many other businesses have just, their, their tour business has, has gone to zero. So I encourage you to purchase gift certificates. Um, the second thing you can do is, is sign up for any of these, um, any of these programs. We're doing them every day at 11 o'clock. Uh, and so most of them are just five bucks. Um, when you spend that five bucks though, we're also gonna send you a gift certificate for five bucks, which you can use for any future IRL in real life tour. Um, so you're basically uh, getting it for free. The same thing applies too. If you don't want to spend five bucks every day and come on, uh, and sign up for every single one individually. Um, if you click on any of the um, programs that are in our calendar right now, you'll see that there's an option for an all access pass, uh, which is 35 bucks. And that gives you access to every single program that we're going to do. Um, so, we're definitely gonna do seven, we might do 14, we might do 21, we might do more than that. So that pass will give you access to, to all of them. So it's great value for money. And again, we'll also send you a gift certificate uh, for 35 bucks that you can use for a real tour 
um, in the future. We encourage people to, you know, connect with us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, um, but, and also sign up for our newsletter. Um, so you'll have information about that and the thank you message you'll get um, after um, this session uh, is, is over. So thanks for the question. Those are some of the ways that um, you can help and support us. Um, but again, you know, think, you know, if you have the means, I understand that a lot of people, your income has gone to zero as well. Um, but if you have the means um, and you want to continue to support, you know, great institutions, great small businesses, you know, go out and buy a gift certificate, buy a membership. Um, it, it really helps people a, a lot. So this has just been incredible 24 hours since we announced this, the, the support that we've gotten from this. Okay. Um, the other thing that I want to mention uh, is that a lot of the programs we're going to be doing, it's not just going to be me or Cindy or Stefan or Doug or Amanda or Brian um, or Gina, uh, all of our guides talking to you. Uh, also, a lot of them are going to be interviews and they're going to highlight our different partners. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to split the proceeds with those organizations. Um, so if you sign up for one, we'll, we'll clearly put who the partner is. Um, you know, every dollar that you spend, uh, we're going to split that. Um, with that organization, um, but you'll still get your $5 gift certificate. So even though $2.50 is going to go to somebody else, you'll still get your $5 gift certificate from Turnstile Tours. So that's one of the ways that we're trying to support um, a lot of our uh, a lot of our great great partners here. So, okay. So we have a couple minutes left. So I want to dive into our last invention, which is really one of the coolest things, um, and it's one of my favorite artifacts. Um, that we have in our collection. Um, so one of the most common questions we get at the Brooklyn Navy Yard on our tours is, did we ever build submarines at the Brooklyn Navy Yard? And the answer is no. But we did a lot of work developing technology for submarines and also repairing submarines. So I'm gonna show you a couple pictures here. Um, okay, so. Today, being in the submarine service of the U.S. Navy is one of the safest jobs you can have um, in the Navy. Um, that was not always the case, especially in the early days of, of submarining. There were a lot of really terrible accidents. Um, and so right here, what you can see, excuse me, is a picture of the USS S-51. Um, so this was a submarine um, that sunk off the coast of Massachusetts after being, being hit uh, by a ship. So in the center of that photo, you can see that tremendous gash um, that was cut into it um, by a ship hitting it. Um, so uh, unfortunately, um, 33 sailors uh, were killed um, in this accident. Um, this photo was actually taken at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, if you look in the foreground of the photo, um, you can see this large cylinder, sort of looks like a giant barrel. Um, there's another one on the left-hand side of the photo. Uh, there's two of them, actually. Um, these are actually pontoons built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard for salvaging the ship. Um, so they raised it up from the broad bottom. They brought it back to the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard and put it into dry dock number four to, uh, you know, figure out uh, what happened to it. Um, and try to salvage uh, salvage the ship. So this is very, very dangerous. And so um, naval engineers and sailors themselves were trying to figure out ways that, you know, if something like this happened to a submarine, how could you escape and survive? Um, and so the first um, invention um, to help with this uh, was called the Momsen Lung. Um, and so here you can see a sailor uh, demonstrating this as he's getting out of the hatch um, of a submarine. So the Momsen lung, um, you can see it, it sort of looks like a, a life preserver. Um, so that would be filled with air. Um, and then you put the nose plugs on, you put that thing in your mouth, um, and you float up to the surface. And, and so that does two things. Number one, it provides flotation so you can float up. Um, in a controlled manner. So one of the things you want to do is control how fast you're ascending so that you don't get um, the bends um, or decompression sickness um, from shooting up to the surface too quickly. So you want to, you want to be able to um, surface in a controlled, slow fashion, um, but be able to breathe uh, while you're doing so. The other thing that's in there is a filter um, that's filtering out the carbon dioxide that you're breathing in and out um, into that chamber there. So it's filtering out so you have safe, clean air to breathe um, when, you get to, uh, when you get to the surface. 
Um, so this was the first this was the first attempt at this. Um, these were used through World War II, um, but they were never there were only a couple of occasions in which they were used uh, successfully. But they had they had a number of challenges um, uh, to actually to actually using them. Um, enter one of the most important facilities in the Brooklyn Navy Yard when we talk about innovation, this is the Material Sciences Lab. Um, so the Material Sciences Lab was built during World War II, and this is really where um, they tested um, different materials, obviously, materials for shipbuilding, um, but also uh, tested um, and designed new equipment. Um, and so that is when um, a, a young lieutenant in the U.S. Navy named uh, Lieutenant Harris Steinke um, he developed an idea while serving at the submarine base in New London, Connecticut, um, for how to improve on uh, the Momsen lung. Um, what he found um, was that it was very difficult um, for sailors to ascend in a controlled manner um, and keep that mouthpiece uh, in place as they were, as they were moving up. Um, and actually the Momsen lung was quite ineffective. Um, and so actually um, after World War II, the Navy stopped using it. And, and what they did was they told sailors, they would train them uh, how to do something called free ascent, which was basically swim to the surface. Um, so they said, you know, you could hold your breath for long enough um, and as long as you swim slowly, um, you know, from up to 300 feet, uh, you could actually reach the surface safely. Um, so this was obviously very dangerous. It was very, very difficult to train sailors to do this. Um, and so what they did was something called buoyant ascent. Um, and so what buoyant ascent uh, is essentially is you have a life preserver um, and you ascend to the surface. But again, you have to hold your breath for quite a long time to do that. And so the idea of Steinke was, what if we took this um, life preserver that's filled with air, and what if we could use that air to help the sailor breathe so that they can ascend in a slow, controlled, and, non, and not a panicked mat matter? Um, and so that's when the Steinke hood uh, was, was invented. So what I'm gonna do, um, is I'm gonna uh, pull uh, pull it out. Yeah. So someone just mentioned um, that uh, the the radio towers of the uh, material sciences lab. Um, those radio towers um, are lit up uh, at night. They have these different colored LEDs on them. So they they did a beautiful restoration of that building. It's now part of Steiner Studios, uh, which is a uh, movie studio. Um, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's our largest employer and actually the largest movie studio in the United States, if you don't count the state of California. Um, so it's, uh, it's a really cool facility. So those are some of the old communications uh, radio towers that are up there. But I'm going to bust out the Steinke hood um, and I'm going to show you how this thing uh, works. So uh, if you have questions in the chat, um, they might go dark for a minute or two because Cindy is actually going to come in here in a second uh, and help me demonstrate it. So let me grab it. I'll be right back. Okay, so this is it. So this is a Steinke hood. Um, this was actually manufactured uh, on here, if you can see, in, in 1985 down in West Virginia. Um, so this was standard issue for submarines um, well into the 1990s, actually. Um, so this was in service for over 30 years. Um, it first came into service in, in 1962. So I'm gonna open it up. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit past uh, 1145. Um, we'll see how long this takes to actually uh, employ. Uh, one thing I should mention, if you know me, if you've seen me lately, I used to have a much fuller beard. Uh, I shaved it off and shaved off my hair, not because of coronavirus. Um, I feel kind of like uh, someone in the movie Alien 3. Um, but uh, I did it in part so that it would be easier to put this thing on. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pull this out. Just bear with me for one second. Okay, so this is it. So... I'm going to unfurl it. So I'll show you the different parts of it. So you can see it, unlike the uh, Momsen lung, this actually has a hood. Um, inside, it does have a mouthpiece, um, but that mouthpiece is not for breathing uh, when you're ascending. One of the challenges they found is that someone would get to the surface and then they 
couldn't really, uh, you know, if you're doing free ascent, you get to the surface and you don't have a life preserver. Um, you don't have anything that you can hang on to. Uh, and so this is a way that you could keep the hood on safely um, and breathe while you're actually on the surface. So when you're ascending, you're not actually putting that uh, in your mouth. Um, you can see here it has this window that faces up so that you can tilt your head up um, as, you're, as you're ascending. Um, and then there are different valves here for, for filling it up with air. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this very small ring over my head and put it on, and then we're gonna inflate it. Normally you would inflate this with a canister of compressed air or an oxygen uh, scuba tank. Um, what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna try and pump it up with a bicycle pump, but it, but it should work. So yeah, so Cindy, you can hear her in the background laughing. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna pull this on. Um, so just hang tight for one second. This is my favorite part. <laughs> I just hope you can get it off. <laughs> okay, you're gonna do it here. Okay. Okay. Let's take this up a little bit. Okay. okay. All right, so I have put this on before. Um, what, how but, am I supposed to pump this? Um, I, so right here. Okay. We got a bicycle pump right here. Okay. And we're going to attach it to this valve right here. I'll just attach it before I put it on. Okay. So you can see right here. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Steinke. Is spelled S T E I N K E for those of you that <laughs> are asking. Okay, ready? Okay. 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 Huh? We're going to start pumping it up. Are you okay in there? Yeah. Okay. This should go around my You room. You might need to hold on to this while I pump. Okay. Okay, you okay? Okay, I'm gonna put the pump on the chair. <laughs> Is it working? Oh, it's, it's blowing up. <laughs> so you're supposed to be blowing on this in the water? No. You doing okay, Amber? Yeah, this is very hot. It's hot, he says. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we want to keep doing this? Keep going. Keep going. Okay, I just want you to be able to get out of it. Okay. Oh. Okay. So now you can see <laughs> this is what it looks like when it's on. Now, um, the idea is that when you're at the bottom of the ocean, can you guys hear? There's incredible pressure um, that's on this uh, on this inflated area. So as you ascend, that pressure is going to decrease, and so this is going to expand. And so essentially what I'm doing right now, or if I was underwater, I'm breathing the air that Cindy pumped into this, um, into this, um, uh, hood. It, into the hood. Um, so this is gonna be my air supply as I ascend, but it's also gonna be my flotation device once I get to the surface. And so when I get to the surface, um, I'm gonna put in the mouthpiece and I can breathe freely the outside air. And so what that allows me to do is not drown, um, but also not breathe the carbon dioxide that's building up inside the hood for my ascent. So I'm gonna put it in right now. Oh, you can hear the air coming out. So there. right now the valve is closed, so I can't breathe. So I'm gonna turn it to on. There's also a zipper here, so I can pull this back if I'm feeling too hot or claustrophobic in here. 
Um, but I'm not going to do that. Oh, right, because it's so, kind of like taped on. Because it's um, it's kind of a seal that we don't want to break because we want to be able to use this in the future. Um, so I'm going to release the valve here to let some of the air out. Do you need help? Um, and then I'm going to take this thing off, okay? Um. Oh. <laughs> All right. So there we go. All right. So um, for the last thing, I want to show you a little video of actually how this thing works. Um, it just take about two minutes. Um, and this was a video that was actually made at the training tank that they um, used to use um, for training sailors how to use this thing. Um, so this was in uh, New London, Connecticut. Um, they, this facility was built in 1930. So again, right around the time of the S-51 and the S-4 disasters um, for training sailors for how to safely escape a sunken submarine. Um, so the facility that they did it in uh, operated up until 1985, and now they have a brand new facility down at the submarine school um, in, in Connecticut. Um, so I'm gonna put this on, just bear with me for one second. Next, the instructor signals the first man. In response, the first man will dump water from the hood and put the appliance in standby position. Remember, check the snorkel in enclosed position, and as soon as the hood covers your head, the instructor will inflate the appliance and the relief valves will begin to lift. You will feel a rush of air around your head. This is air from the buoyancy chamber circulating through the hood. The instructor will signal you to leave the lock when ready. The next action will take only a few seconds. Now take a deep breath and hold it. The instructor will disconnect the air hose. With your hand on the door combing, place your right foot firmly on the step outside. Push yourself to a sitting position. Start through the door sideways. At the same time, bring your left hand to the door comb. Your snap hook will be connected to the cable by an instructor. Now, simultaneously turn to face the door and bring your left foot through the door alongside your right foot. Hold the door combing tightly with both hands to counteract the positive buoyancy of the appliance. Stand up straight. Head well back, looking upward. On the instructor's signal, exhale, release hold, commence breathing through your mouth, and assume the ascent position. Arms overhead and thumbs interlocked. Now, here is an actual ascent. During your ascent, under all circumstances, breathe through your mouth. Remember to breathe through your mouth. As soon as you break the surface, immediately place the snorkel in your mouth. Turn right to open and breathe through it. All right, so thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Now you know how to escape from a sunken submarine. So we'll see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Thanks so much to everybody at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Thanks so much to Stefan and Cindy. Um, and that's all from us today. So sign up for tomorrow's class, which is going to be um, with Saad Borkati of Essex Olive and Spice House. We're going to do a virtual olive oil tasting. And you can sign up at our website 
at turnstiletours.com. Thanks so much, everybody.